Hi, good evening. I'm Peter Rao, Senior Fellow and Director of the Center on Europe and Eurasia here at Hudson Institute. And it's my pleasure to welcome you all to the Betsy and Walter Stern Conference Center. Ever since Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine, and even for some time quite before that, Hudson Institute has been alive to the importance of Ukraine to American national security and the importance of Ukraine prevailing in its conflict against Russia. As H.R. McMaster, the now chair of the Hudson Institute Japan Chair Advisory Board, put it in the early days after full, Russia's full-scale invasion, Ukraine can win this war. Most recently, Mike Pompeo, also a distinguished fellow here, and of course, our nation's 70th Secretary of State, made a powerful case in front of the Capitol for Ukraine aid. Make no mistake, Secretary Pompeo said, the outcome of this war will have a direct impact on US national security. Nobody at Hudson, however, has thought more about Ukraine and its relation to American national security than Luke Coffey, senior fellow here. He has written widely about the conflict and spoken about it for years, and his myth fact documents have become something of a legendary one within the halls of Hudson and also read widely outside of Hudson. In fact, his most recent, The 14 Facts About USA to Ukraine, which you can find on the Hudson.org website, is perhaps the most cutting of all. As the myths get worse, his facts seem to get better. So I encourage you all uh, to take a look and read them. Today, we're honored to learn more about the war in Ukraine and perhaps debunk another myth or two with Andrew Yermak, head of office of the president of Ukraine, who will be joined on stage in conversation with Luke. It's been com commonplace to say at events like this that a speaker requires no introduction, but in this case, I think it truly is the case. Andrew Yermak is the closest of advisors to President Zelensky, and we're delighted to have him here today. We're gonna to first have an introductory video, and then the two gentlemen will have a conversation here after a few opening remarks from Mr. Yermak. So, enjoy the video. The world needs peace. Sustainable, universal, just. Achieving peace demands action, joined, determined, Systematic. The Ukrainian peace formula developed by President Zelensky propels these actions forward. Ten points. Ten vital directions rooted in the UN Charter and international law. Ukraine is actively pursuing peace, channeling all its efforts into implementing the peace formula. Two significant peace summits in Copenhagen and Jeddah have paved the way for substantial progress. Dedicated groups have been diligently working on each focal area outlined in the formula. Intensive discussions with diplomats, particularly focusing on the initial five points, have led to meticulously crafted action plans. Radiation and nuclear safety. At the Chernobyl nuclear power plant, ambassadors from different countries emphasized the importance of safe nuclear energy. Cross-border accidents and attacks pose threats to global safety. Upholding Ukrainian sovereignty is vital. The IAEA must ensure nuclear safety at civilian sites. Food security. The meeting at a bakery in Kyiv Oblast, targeted in Russian attack, emphasized the crucial need to depoliticize food issues. The war in Ukraine jeopardizes global food security, risking hunger for millions. Ukraine, vital in grain exports, faces disruption. Food security must be conflict-free. Energy security. During the meeting at the Cabinet of Ministers Club, discussion centered on the alarming vulnerabilities of Ukraine's energy facilities. The looming threat of winter attacks not only endangers Ukraine, but also poses significant global energy risks. Maintaining steadfast international support for Ukraine's energy infrastructure is imperative in ensuring stability and security. Release of prisoners and deported persons. In a meeting with delegates from 70-plus countries, the dire situation of thousands, including civilians, held in Russian-occupied areas was discussed. Swift action is imperative. Ensuring the safe return of all Ukrainian detainees, in compliance with international law such as the Geneva Conventions, is an urgent priority. Restoration of Ukraine's territorial integrity. World stands firm in upholding Ukraine's sovereignty, independence and territorial integrity. These principles enshrined in the UN Charter and reaffirmed by the UN General Assembly. Restoration of Ukraine's territorial integrity, including currently occupied regions, is non-negotiable. A unanimous understanding emerged. The path to peace for Ukraine and the world hinges on reinstating respect for the UN Charter and key tenets of international law. 
The Ukrainian peace formula, developed by President Zelensky, unites global leaders, paving the way for lasting peace amid Russia's actions. Through steadfast collaboration, they seek broad international support for a just and enduring peace, benefiting all of humanity. The forthcoming conference in Valletta, Malta, represents a crucial juncture, and our anticipation for substantial outcomes is heightened. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, friends, uh, first and uh, foremost, I would like to thank you for having me here. It's a great honor and pleasure to speak before the community that has been a stronghold of democracy and freedom since the hottest time of the Cold War. This place was created to ponder the impossible, a better and safer future. And today, Hermann Hans, thinking about the unthinkable principle, seems to be more relevant than ever. What we all have to do? To imagine the impossible to make it happen. For 60, 128 days of the full-scale Russian invasion, Ukraine have been proving uh, the, the impossible is only that hasn't been done yet. It seemed impossible to stop the Russian invading forces. It seemed impossible to implement comprehensive sanctions against aggressor country. Standing the firm against the terror and nuclear armed states, blackmail also seemed impossible, as well as in imposing our own agenda on them. But Ukraine holds on, defends, lives. We have already liberated half of the occupied territories. We have busted the myth of the second army in the world. Now, it is the second army in Ukraine. This became possible because we are not alone. America has once again demonstrated its leadership. It's confirmed its status as become of the freedom. It was the first to help a nation's fighting against tyranny. Ukrainians are immensely grateful to the people, Congress, President Biden for this. But your assistance, it's not charity, it's in the investments in the suffer, uh, suffer world. Together, we have created a new geopolitical reality. Ukraine's resilience in defending freedom and the value driving choice of our alliance under the United States leadership have caused tectonic shifts. Democracy, democracies all over the world have proven the, their ability to unite it and face tyranny. Fortitude of the Ukrainian people, valor of our defenders, and the joint efforts of our aliens have made Russia blitzkrieg fail. But two years into full-scale war, Russia is still not defeated. What's more, amid a barrage of the fake messages emanating from Moscow, there is one undeniable truth. They are not going to stop. They hope to outlast and outenter the unity of democracies. They know that their success depends on the West adopting the re a real politic approach rather than a value-based policy. To this end, Moscow has revived the axis of evil. Let's set the record straight. It had been done in long before President Bush coined the terms. For decades, it has been forming a coalition of autocratic regimes, fringe movements, and terroristic organizations. And now, these coalitions of arikatically minded monster poses an ever increasing threat of humanity. Restoring the status of the superpower has become a real obsession of the Kremlin. Russian leadership is fixated on revenge 
for the Cold War, and they repeatedly refer to its practices. In the modern world, in the world built on the partnership and consensus of the interests, Russia does not have competitive advantages. The only chance for them is to create the situations that the difference between peace and war becomes illusory. They put all their efforts into this. They see what happening in the Middle East. We know that the flames of the conflicts is, are being themed in the Balkans. We have needless attempts to ignite the, this, this Sahel. Points of instability will arise worldwide until Ukraine prevail. Therefore, there is not only our strategic interest, it is the interest of United States as well. Present day, Russia as a state created for the confrontations. That means one thing, we can't effort fatigue. None of us. Ukraine stands and wins. The rules-based order stands and wins. As Ronald Reagan put, in, uh, put it, we have come to a time for choosing. It is either up to freedom, law, and order, or down to totalitarianism. Ukraine's choice is absolutely clear. We are firmly committed to restore Ukraine's sovereignty over all internationally recognized territory. Against all odds, Ukraine's defense forces have gained a foothold on the left bank of, uh, bank of the Dnieper. Step by step, we have demilitarized Crimea. We have covered 70% of the distance. And our counteroffensive is development. We know how to achieve victory. President Zelensky has a clear plan. Among the priorities, he identifies the developments of our defense industry and then deploying it our own arms productions. But what we will be later? Meanwhile, we need weapons right now. Russia still has air superiority. It is still a capable of producing missiles due to invasion of sanctions. Not to mention the Iranian drones and North Korean artillery rounds. So we need more restrictions against them. And we especially need air defense systems. I tell you the truth. This winter will be tough for us as well. We will again resort trying to terrorize our citizens by attacking power grids and if infrastructures. Strengthening air defense will be a guarantee for recovery. For the reconstruction of Ukraine, a reliable umbrella is needed. Its reinforcement in particular will allow us to reopen one of the airports in Ukraine. We are already working on these, our partners. It's a sign with the turning points in the war is approaching. The next year will be decisive in this regards. Let me assure you, we can and do account for every defense item we get. Transparency matters. We are absolutely aware of that. President Zelensky and our team are employing with principles uh, everywhere. Ukraine is successfully reforming despite the war. The European Commission's recommendations to start accession talks is clear evidence. The myth of most corrupted European country is officially busted. The myth of the frozen transformation is busted. And the myth of democracy decline is busted too. Of course, reforming while fighting is a very hard. Frankly speaking, both cost enormous money. But why not make Russia for pay for Ukraine's defense? Reconstructions won't have much sense if they won't win. We seek peace, but not just any peace. In our case, 
ending the war. For the compromise, it's nothing more than posing it. Ukraine will not repeat the mistake of Minsk. And I believe that the only rights Normandy formats is one described by Ronald Reagan. We are bound by reality. The strength of America alliance is vital to United States and the American security guarantees is essential to, co to continue freedom of European democracies. My people are enormously grateful to United States for your following this path today. And I hope that America will play a leading role in filling the framework of the security commitments established with the G7 Williams Declaration. Security in all its forms, from nuclear to the food to the environmental, is one of the three pillars of the President Zelensky peaceful formula that I'm sure is globally applicable. The remaining two are justice and humanity. Restoring Ukrainian integrity is just. Punishing the aggressor is just. Making them to pay is just. And regarding humanity, we need to return all hostages the Russians have taken, both prisoners of war and civilians. But first of all, we need to bring back Ukrainian kids. Tens of thousands of them have been abducted. We are working on all these tracks together with our international partners. These streams are joined in that I believe they'll soon become an action plan to implement the peaceful formula. I'm sure that the formula can become a universal algorithm for the conflict resolutions. The first time in the history, it opened the opportunity for leadership for all responsible countries with respect international law. Yes, the formula is Ukrainian, but the action plan for its implementation will be collective efforts. The formula is a platform that promotes peace and dialogues. Today, more than 80 countries are already working on these implementations. Importantly, among them, an increasing number are from Global South. We are literally untying the world by these coalitions of dealing will never come to life without Americans' involvement. We have already held three meetings of the security advisors to create the actions plan for the implementation of the peace formula. The first meetings was attended by representatives from 15 countries and organizations. The second, they had 42 participants. And the most recent, one had 66. For us, this is a very positive sign. Peace needs co-offers. And then a, a critical mass is gathered Russia will have to submit. Let me emphasize. It's going to be our common actions plan to make the rules-based order work again. The world would benefit. Ukraine would benefit. America would benefit. And what's more, it would be secure its role as a global power of good. For implementing the plan requires effective and decisive leadership. The leadership that, that will put to end to aggression. The Woodrow Wilson famous 14 points he stated, we cannot be separated in the interest or divided in purpose. We stand together until the end, just like a century ago. Determinations and unity have given us a, uh, us a unique opportunity to change the world. Let's do it. Thank you very much. Slava Ukraini. Thank you very much for that very passionate address. You uh, said a lot of messages that need to be heard here in Washington, uh, especially considering the importance uh, uh, and the timing of your visit as uh, our lawmakers are considering additional U.S. assistance uh, to, your, to Ukraine. 
here at, at Hudson, and I'm guessing I can speak on behalf of everyone in this, in this room. We're here for you, we're supporting you, and we want to do everything we can to make sure that your country gets the, the weapons and resources it needs, not to just survive, but to win on the, on the battlefield. Now, I, I want to ask a question going back in time a little bit. Uh, and it's uh, something that uh, I've often thought about, and now I have this opportunity to ask someone who was there at that moment, at that time. Now, I want to go back to the night of February 25th, when President Zelensky, with you standing behind him and others outside in a dark night in Kyiv, with all the uncertainty about what was going to happen, uh, sent a message not only to the Ukrainian people, but to the world, and he said, we're all here. And I believe that these three words are probably the most important three words that have been spoken in the 21st century, and I think it actually changed the course of history. So I would just love to hear, you know, what was the quick, the, quickly speaking, what was the lead up to that moment? What was, who came up with this idea to broadcast this message in such a way? It's a, it's a very modern, almost millennial way to, to address the world during a time of war. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I, I will be very honest with you that uh, just in that moment uh, and uh, till today, not the president, uh, not uh, our team, we not feel ourselves as uh, uh, heroes. Uh, we do what uh, we have to do in this moment because uh, we understand that uh, uh, what catastrophe uh, we really have and of course it was our obligations uh, to be this uh, our country our people and uh, you know the the idea to make this uh, tape uh, uh, belong to the president and uh, uh, for him it was very important uh, to give this signal first of all to Ukrainians that the presidents in the capital and the presidents uh, uh, will be fighting together this uh, all Ukrainians you know I, I if I can mention uh, uh, I'm today in the morning uh, have in the White House the meetings the, the National Security Advisors uh, uh, from United States, of course, from Great Britain, France, and Germany. And we uh, recall the, uh, our meetings uh, before one week of the full-scale invasions. We met in Brussels, and at the end of this meeting, somebody asked me, uh, Okay, you are, I understand we discussed a lot of issues, but if it's happened, what you will doing? I said, we will fighting. <laughs> and I remember their eyes, and uh, of course they don't believe me. And just today they said, honestly, we feel that maybe we did last time, last time I see you. But uh, now it's... Now you're back. <laughs> yeah, if somebody... It's why it's maybe answered to this, some people who is said that counteroffensive, it's not so uh, quick, that uh, it's something not happens uh, uh, so quick. This is the answer. What today is my colleagues to said. We never can imagine and believe that me will meet in two years in Washington and will discuss about how to help to win Ukraine. And uh, once again, for this moment, we liberated 50% of the territory, which was occupied from 24 of the February. You know, sometimes it's necessary that our friends, the uh, Americans people, uh, first of all, uh, to know the truth, to know the lot of positive things, because we already, we already, uh, in some part, we already win. This is your leadership, and you are heroes. American is heroes because you uh, give to us so big support, so help. We stop the second army in the world. 
Now, as I said, the second army in Ukraine. And American's leadership now to prevent this, the uh, potential uh, new world war in the Middle East. You all of us, all Americans is here. Thank you very much. And we Ukrainians never forget that you, this are standing from the early days of these full scale invasions. And I'm sure our victory will be joint victory of, of the, the United States. Thank you. Absolutely. And this is for you. <clears throat> Absolutely right. I couldn't agree with you more. Now, we all saw the video about uh, President Zelensky's peace formula. I think this is one of the most important messages that uh, American policymakers need to hear and learn about because there are a lot of critics, a lot of skeptics, especially on Capitol Hill. But I don't want to say a lot, but they're very loud. So we have loud skeptics and critics on Capitol Hill who say that President Zelensky doesn't want peace, that there is no um, desire for uh, peace talks. He just wants this war to continue so he can consolidate power. Now, we all know that this is nonsense, but can you tell us about uh, some of the thinking behind his peace formula? Where are areas of the peace formula that have been more successful than others? What are some areas of the peace formula that need more attention and work? I think this would be very interesting for some of uh, the policymakers here. Thank you. First of all, uh, the one year ago, the President Zelensky announced and uh, proposed his initiatives uh, in the G20 meetings in Bali. And why this uh, peace, peaceful f plan, peaceful formula so unique? First of all, it's absolutely 100% uh, based on the international law and the principle of the uh, statutes of the United Nations. It's not just about wishes of Ukraine. Each points based plus, uh, based of this principle plus, you can found the special resolution of the General Assembly, which confirmed, already confirmed, already voted uh, to support these principles. The second, it's uh, uh, really about how to end this war, how to bring just peace, because we have some bad experience in the past. Then me personally, I'm participated, represents Ukraine in the Normandy formats. Mm. And just from 2019, we have more than 200 rounds of negotiations with Russia. And we can see what happened <laughs> once uh, we have the talkings during 12 hours not stop in the office of the Germany Chancellor. And it's not work because we are fighting the thrashes and our friends uh, sitting like a witness and see to it. I think that have this experience, we are absolutely sure that we need plan plan which will be supported by responsible country, including our strategic partners, but also including the global south countries, who is or natural or have the some good relations with Russia. It gives the status of this plan that is just plan. Next, very important, it's maybe first in the history then all so difficult negotiations happened, not under the table, not some informally, confidential, openly. We are sitting together. We are talking because, because this plan includes not just about uh, the war, about the, the crisis which arise as the result of this war. We're talking about food security. We're talking about nuclear security. We're talking about humanitarian things. I'm sorry, today we have more than 20,000 uh, Ukrainian children kidnapped and deported. We have the thousands of the uh, prisons uh, of the war, civilians, military. And sorry, we have in 21st century, we have the international organizations who can be know what necessary to do. 
Unfortunately, Red Cross, we have not during two years any facts that representative of these organizations coming for one person who is in the prison in the occupied uh, territory or in Russia to check the conditions, to check the conditions accordingly to the Geneva Conve <laughs> Conventions. And it is a, it's a catastrophe that we back to the time, the more dar the darkness time of the Second World War, then we back concentrated camp. If I can describe to you what I'm listening, because I'm personally involved of the exchange of the prisoners, and most important, most famous exchange that we are back 250 people, including American citizens. The Ukrainians who is back, the minimum uh, the person lost uh, 40 kilo. You can imagine what these people describe, what happened in this uh, uh, concentrated camp. As why we said it's new Nazism, it's, it's new fascism, absolutely. What is interesting, it's not just about this. Then our people liberated Kievsk region. We found original map the Russian use map of Second War from Nazis. They use the same map. And you know, it's, uh, it, it's terrible. It's terrible. And we can see uh, now the wave of the anti Semitism, which we never see after the time of uh, the Second uh, World War. And now we can see this line that today it's Iran together this Russia and uh, it's and as I said now in Middle East Ukraine and they looking to the Balkans believe me if Ukraine not stop and not win they have not motivation to not go to the Baltic countries to the Poland and today we are fighting. I'd like to say that I come to DC for a short visit to say Ukraine leave, Ukraine fighting. We absolutely sure that we win. Only what we ask, please help us. We not ask send your soldiers. We ask continue to keep this support. And we definitely, we obviously will win. And this is will be, you know, we back our fightings with your help. We back to the all the world attitude that it's possible not afraid, that it's possible to be real independent. I think we can't lose this opportunity. It's historical moment. It's historical moment for all of us. And once again, thank you that you standing with Ukraine from the very beginning with any hesitation. And if we compare the real situations with the uh, running, I think for 100 meters, 70 meters we already done. It's most important to really to win what we ask. Um, the, recently, the, the former NATO Secretary General Anders Fal Rasmussen suggested that Ukraine might be able to join NATO under some sort of arrangement that would leave part of your territories under Russian occupation. Uh, uh, I'm sure it's a, a bit more complex than that, but that is what he proposed. Is this something that you think is a viable solution or a non-starter from your point of view? When I first time uh, read these articles, I, my first impression was the same. And of course, I, 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 I speak this, uh, uh, my colleagues wh with whom we work and have the very successful results, Kyiv Security Compact, which is on the base of the Vilnius declarations. And now more than 30 countries joined this, and we already opened the consultation for the security guarantees agreements. It's opinion of Anders. 
he, do, he didn't mention that uh, uh, because he know our principle. Our principles are very clear, very, uh, very strong. Any compromise with independence, territorial integrity, sovereignty. It's his opinion how uh, to make the first steps. He compared the, the situation with the uh, West and East Germany. Uh, it's difficult to say we have our uh, unique examples. <coughs> and of course, uh, for us, it's a very important to back all our territories, including Donbass, including uh, Crimea, and this is our principle. And of course, uh, we uh, see all of us that the, especially after this invasion, that one most uh, strong alliance, military alliance, it's NATO. One real guarantee security, it's NATO. And we're very happy that in our fightings make this absolutely real facts. Russia have the zero chances against NATO. Long period of times, there is a different positions. The people, some countries, just the members of the NATO, thinks that it's so strong, it's impossible to, to just thinking, because it's a big monster. Ukraine, absolutely show, not exist this monster. We stopped this monster near of the Kyiv. We destroyed this myth about the once again, second army in the world, and we are doing together. Let's finish this job. We have a bit of time to go to the floor for questions. Uh, we have a couple of microphones lying around, so if um, we'll, we'll start over here on this side, then we'll move over to this side here. So the, the gentleman in the front, front row here, we have a microphone. If you could please um, state your name and any uh, relevant affiliation, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you, Anton LaGuardia of The Economist. Uh, you spoke about the need for more weapons and for more help to help you win. What happens if Congress uh, either delays further aid to Ukraine or stops it entirely? How will Ukraine cope? First of all, I don't believe that it's happened. I don't believe because I feel uh, I, I, I feel and I'm not changed uh, my position and after first day here in DC that uh, uh, Americans uh, change their opinion and their support. I'm uh, from the last, I will have tomorrow many meetings in Hills, but the last visit of President Zelensky uh, and his meetings uh, in the Congress, we still, and after many visits of the congressmen, senators to Ukraine of both parties, we still feel very strong by uh, partisan support uh, in the Congress. Of course, uh, we, I can say, we never stop, in any case, Ukrainians, the people who is living in Ukraine during these two, practically two years, who is every night going to sleep and have not guarantees to wake up. But we made our choice. We will be fighting up to the, our victory. But of course, this victory will be more quick and we survive more life if the help will be continued. Okay, the, the gentleman in the red tie, gray hair in the middle there, yep. So, <clears throat> Nika Guarabia from Georgia, I'm from Tavari Arche, the critical outlets uh, in Georgia. So Great to see the representative of Georgia here. Yeah, <laughs> yes, but I'm not from government, I'm not, <laughs> not, not Georgian dream. So I'm very so I'm ashamed of this, but still Georgians are fighting in Ukraine and doing their best. So thank you very much for your um, support of civiliz civilized world, I would say. So your fight is uh, the, our fight as well, ours, I mean, here, all of us. 
so my question is, uh, you're, you are not just in a warfare, but probably in a propaganda war as well. So you mentioned this speech, Mitut, uh, that Yermak is to president is to that. Actually, that was defeat of Russian propaganda. What is very important thing because in 2008 in Georgia, in 2014 in uh, Crimea, that was fog of war, and Russia actually won propaganda war, and then was everything goes easily. So. What is now your challenges in this sense? I mean, how works Russian propaganda on the ground in Ukraine? Because I know that that is one of the strongest points of Russia. Maybe it's not a second, and definitely it's not the second army in the world, but in sense of propaganda, it could be one of the most powerful armies in the world. Thank you for these questions. I know I can uh, confirm uh, what you said because I was in Georgia in the first day of the Russian aggressions. I have a lot of friends, I very love your country and I know exactly what happened. You're absolutely right, the propaganda, Russian propaganda machine, it's not stopping, it's work. And uh, we are discussed it today during the other meetings of the National Security Advisors. We are talking with the colleagues of uh, 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 the G7 and NATO. It's time uh, to very, very coordinate our activity because, uh, you know, this propaganda machine works everywhere. Unfortunately, it's working here in the United States. It's working in the Europe. It's working in Ukraine. And of course, only if we will uh, together coordinate, tell the truth, what is a very important, that the people know the truth. And this is our obligations. And of course, uh, we are very concentrated on this. And we will continue hardly work. Uh, because, uh, you know, it's really, in the beginning of the full-scale invasions, uh, our initiatives, our so strong uh, unity, the, the partners, as especially in the area of the informational uh, issue, it's a very help. It's a very help because, uh, you know, the, today it's Russia, it's not just a terroristic country. It's a country of totally lie. They blocked everything. These, their people have information just about 10% of the Russian soldiers who is already killed in, uh, in Ukraine. They not just take body of the killed Russians. They don't tell about this. And this is why it's so big. It's two different world. Because for us, life for one person, it's important. For them, they don't calculate people, absolutely. But you're absolutely right. It's, uh, it's, it's a very important thing and got, very important issue. We got time for two more. Uh, the gentleman in the front and then um, back on this side. Thank you very much. Misha Kamandowski, The Voice of America. Mr. Yermak, uh, I've got like, two short questions, if I may. Uh, Let's make them very short. Sir. Very yeah, short. First of all, like uh, President Biden is set to meet with President Xi of China in a couple of days. And what message would you like him to deliver on behalf of Ukraine? And perhaps there is um, a message that you would like to deliver to the Chinese delegation. And the second question, you told me in an interview half a year ago that uh, the invita Ukraine's invitation to NATO would be like a catalyst of, of peace. Um, do you still think that it would be, it would um, um, catalyze the, the peace in Ukraine? Thank you. Thank you. First of all, the message is that it's important that uh, China will play their role to uh, end this war in Ukraine. You know that the representative of China was in Jeddah in the second meeting of the National Security Advisor, but not be in Malta. And we hope, because in the level of ambassadors, Chinese ambassadors uh, sometimes participated. We think that it's necessary that China will be in the table. This is uh, one message. And the second, uh, it's time uh, to be with Ukraine, this country who win this war. 
The second, I still in the position that invitation to the NATO, it's uh, strong arguments to stop the war. Russia, it's not the country who have the right to decide it who will be or not in the members of the NATO. Russia have to recognize new reality. Sweden, Finland, Ukraine will be the members of the NATO. Somebody already, Ukraine in the future. Hi, Bart Marcois. I'm a retired diplomat, a retired senior Sorry. official. All right, we're we're going to take both together quickly. Oh, I beg your pardon. No, I sorry, you were it's probably at me. I directed traffic incorrectly. The bo you're both over there, so let's just take them back to back, and then we'll we'll uh, let Mr. Yermark oh, get out of here. You know, no worries. Pardon. Go ahead. Uh, I just wanted to ask you. I've admired from for the last couple of years your use of diplomacy, public diplomacy. Um, the, 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 the broad spectrum of diplomatic tools. I'd like to ask you about a part of the spectrum we don't usually talk much about. We've seen some really impressive performances by Kirill Budinov and his uh, intelligence apparatus, but we don't hear much about the foreign intelligence uh, group. Can you talk a little bit about what they're doing and their contributions to... Uh, <laughs> I, I didn't mean to be funny, I'm sorry. And we'll take both together and then... Okay. Thank you, Josh Rogan, Washington Post. First of all, well done. Oldest trick in the book. <laughs> Start talking. Um, sir, I, I want to ask you about the, uh, the, the winter uh, situation in Ukraine. Winter is coming. Last winter, we saw broad-scale attacks on Ukraine's energy infrastructure. Are you expecting that again? Uh, if so, what preparations have you put in place? What do you need to protect uh, Ukraine's energy infrastructure? And what would be the consequence if, as some Republicans, as some pro-Ukraine Republicans are saying, if Congress gives you the military aid but not the economic aid? A lot of even pro-Ukraine Republicans say, give them, like Nikki Haley, Senator Graham, say, you can have the weapons but not the money. What would be the consequence if that ends up being the decision? Thank you. It will be wrong. I think, I think uh, as why we uh, continue our meetings and will continue tomorrow to explain that is important. And uh, we have the very strong arguments. And I hope that our colleagues uh, will uh, heard it. And uh, of course, uh, we are preparing for the tough winter. And uh, one year and uh, we have the uh, some preparations we better prepared for this winter but it's still a lot of uh, concerns is why of course we are we we sure that russia continue this strategy to attack of our infrastructure one questions we need more our defense and your questions i i can say very shortly you know in our big uh, team uh, a lot of kind of intelligence, including foreign intelligence, we work closely and uh, in big group of the people. And uh, believe me, what you can see, it's uh, the result of the, of the working of uh, all our militaries, intelligence, uh, and, uh, and we will continue this because we need to win. All right, well, you're looking at one of the busiest uh, men in Washington Thank you. right now. Thank you. So we have to get going. Thank you very Thank you much, so much for all of you.